Good evening, everybody. Thanks for the turnout on this beautiful Berlin spring day. We've waited long enough for that. Although we shouldn't be complaining about the rain, of course, these days. We're pretty glad that fell. So uh, welcome to our first session of Making Sense of the Digital Society in 2023. We started more than five years ago in December 2017. I can't believe we're already in our sixth season. It's going to be a little shorter season than usual. Uh, three events are planned uh, here in Berlin. Uh, today, the next one will be roughly in September, and the closing event in December. So welcome to season six, so to speak, of this joint venture between the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society and um, Federal Agency for Civic Education. And thank you, thank you also, Hebel am Ufa Hau, I think one of the most beautiful theaters we have here in the town of Berlin. And welcome also the viewers uh, wherever you're watching on Alex TV on Haufia, which is the digital sphere of uh, Hebel and Ufer and on the respective websites um, of the partners involved in this event. Some of you probably may know already um, how this is going about. This is going to be the talk after my introduction. We'll have a one-on-one -on -one conversation for maybe, we'll see how this goes, maybe 15 to 20 minutes, maybe a little more. Uh, there'll be microphones here on the floor for you to ask questions in the venue. There's also a participatory tool called Slido. I think you'll see it on a slide in a minute where you can ask questions anonymously. I think you can also vote them up or down, uh, whatever questions you'd like, to be, uh, you'd like to have answered here. They're going to be read out by somebody in the audience, and we're going to talk about this on stage then. It will be run between, we don't know exactly, 90 or at the most 120 minutes. Kind of depends on you, too, if you uh, are up to asking questions or not. So I think it is probably safe to say, especially in this room full of experts and people interested in the topic, that artificial intelligence has been all over your social or traditional media feeds in the last, what, couple of years, months, weeks, even days. AI has certainly been part of this series, especially the ethics of AI, but things have moved on so fast. Just think of what happened between our last session in Frankfurt, actually, with Stefania Milan in October and now. Open AI's ChatGPT, GPT-4, Google's BART, Microsoft's Bing, there's a race going on to almost quote the funk musician Sly Stone, who turned 80 years old last month, by the way, and his famous album of 1971, which was titled There's a Riot Going On. The AI race, the riot, what the current AI coverage and the bleak Sly Stone album also have in common is the conviction or the belief that society was or is again at a turning point. Sly Stone, the black American superstar with a biracial band who paved the way for Prince later, Sly Stone turned in 1971 from optimism to stark pessimism with this album. The civil rights movement crashed. When even stars like him had to face gunpoint backstage in Las Vegas because his girlfriend was white. The fun in music, gone. The inner cities, not in good shape. Sly was not alone in this. Think of another milestone record of 1971, Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. The outlook in pop music was very bleak. Kind of like AI today. From the riot to the tech race, we have seen two open letters just recently, the first by global tech leaders, the second by scientists, asking for a temporary halt in research. One asked for a six-month moratorium on AI research in order to, I'm quoting, audit the algorithms, as Yevgeny Morozov put it with a smirk, as always, in The Guardian, or at least warn about the ethics in this capitalist race, as the scientists had it. Moreover, another news, a top senior scientist like Jeffrey Hinton is leaving Google in order to speak more freely about the dangers of AI, something the man, the man behind the idea of the neural network had not foreseen to come so close so quickly. Let me quote the New York Times just from the beginning of this week, 1st of May. It's not a holiday in the US, apparently. I quote, Dr. Hinton said, that when people used to ask him how he could work on technology that was potentially dangerous, he would paraphrase Robert Oppenheimer, who led the US effort to build the atomic bomb. Oppenheimer said, when you see something that is technically sweet, you go ahead and do it. That's the engineer talking, of course, 
but are there different voices to be taken into account? Jeff Hinton, sometimes referred to as the godfather of AI, had not always been right with his predictions. In a talk in this series here from June 2020 in this very theater, which was empty due to COVID at the time, it was just the two of us actually, Joanna Bryson showed a clip from a conference of Norwegian radiologists. At this conference, Hinton basically told his audience, stop training radiologists. AI is soon going to take care of that. Four years later, Joanna Bryson remarked, there were more radiologists than ever. Not despite of AI, but because of it. Because AI pushed productivity. But enough on the past of AI. Tonight we will get a very concrete outlook on how AI can work for us, not against us in the future. So this is neither a doomer nor a boomer night, so to speak how it will be able to work for us, I should maybe add. Because there are many prerequisites that will have to be put in place before this happens, especially now in this time of a giant power grab, how tonight's speaker called the current state of AI when we met for coffee yesterday. The questions then will be, among others, whose power? How to distribute it more evenly? What about the role workers will play in the workplace, in the changing workplace? How to adapt and adopt less discriminating AI on a private entrepreneurial and then a public regulatory level? What can be done by technological in innovation and what can't? Really happy she's here with us tonight because her research, much of it about the work, about the notion of work and the workplace fits in so well in this series and complements what we've heard in the last more than five years now and takes us further into the future. She is the executive director of the Minderoo Center for Technology and Democracy at the University of Cambridge. Her books include Venture Labor in 2012, Self-Tracking 2016, and just last year, Human-Centered Data Science, um, published at MIT, MIT also. Her research focuses on the effects of the rapid expansion of our digital information environment on workers and workplaces in our everyday lives. She's a sociologist schooled at Columbia University and, and advises international organizations, including UNESCO, the OECD, and uh, the Women's Forum for the Economy and Society. She chairs the International Scientific Committee of the UK's Trusted Autonomous Systems Program, among many others. Her academic research has won both engineering and social sciences awards. Also, uh, please do check out a very special website if you want to tell your parents or your kids what you did tonight, actually. Um, she led the team that won the 2021 Webby for the best educational website on the internet, and it's called A to Z of AI. And it really is very instructional and educational. And it has reached, imagine that, over 1 million users in 17 different languages. Please welcome now from Kentucky, where she was born, to New Mexico, to New York, now from Cambridge to Berlin, please welcome Gina Neff. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Toby, for that very kind introduction. Thank all of you for joining us on such a glorious and sunny evening here in Berlin. And thank you to our hosts this evening um, for convening us together in this glorious and beautiful space. My talk tonight will apply two core insights from science and technology studies to what we should be thinking about in terms of artificial intelligence. Now, those of you who study these concepts coming from the academy will recognize a focus on infrastructure as being central to how we think about technology and the relationship in socio-technical systems. The idea of work can be thought of in two ways, and tonight I'm going to bring in a concept rooted in 
design in use. That technologies always have a completion that comes with how people use them, how they get finished. That is, that we work on them by working with technologies. And then I'll point to what our future might hold and might look like. I'll take, hopefully, equal, about equal chunks in these three, in these three sections. I'd like to start with a metaphor from AI researcher, computer scientist, British computer scientist living in the United States, Stuart Russell. He's used this metaphor of asphalt, pavement, and he said, imagine, imagine that there are pavement asphalt engineers who are really, really good at making asphalt. And imagine, they said, well, because we're so good at being engineers that we should make the decisions on where asphalt should go. That beach, we don't really need it. It would be much better paved. Your garden, nah, grass is overrated. Pavement is much more efficient. In fact, you don't want to be left behind. You must start paving, paving quickly and paving fast. Now, in many ways, this is an apt metaphor for what is happening. Oh, sorry, forgive me. In many ways, this is an apt metaphor for what is happening. Um, that the idea that engineers have the loudest voices in the decisions that are social, political, and cultural is not going to be a surprise after the recent headlines. But there's another way that we should be thinking about infrastructure, and especially when we think about infrastructure that's being built and the choices being made now. The idea that we will no longer be able to understand whether or not we're standing on pavement, beach, or grass is soon going to be part of the realities that we face in our everyday life. Put aside for a moment the hype, the exuberance, the fears that generative AI models such as ChatGPT and DALL-E and their ilk, put aside those fears for a moment and think about how these technologies are going to be soon integrated into the products and services that we use on an everyday life. So unlike asphalt, we won't be able to see when or how or whether we're using choices, tools, interactions, decisions that are may being made for us. There's another way that infrastructure becomes a very important metaphor for how we think about um, um, our, our daily interactions. Sorry, I'm trying to get my script down. Forgive me just a moment. There's another, another powerful way this becomes infrastructure. Those of you from science and technology studies recognize that infrastructures are powerful social forces once they become invisible. That is, the invisibility of infrastructure is literally what makes an infrastructure. We have choices, I will argue tonight. We have choices that place us in a moment at which we can understand how our technological infrastructure is influencing our societies. And we have choices that we can make today in making AI, artificial intelligence technologies, work and work better for us. But unfortunately, those choices are being vocally held by people who say they understand the engineering, not those of us who say, wait a minute, we should have some autonomy, some accountability, and some transparency over the decisions being made. There's three ways to think about the data 
that is powering our systems today. Infrastructure allows us to see that the data driving AI models are made. They're not natural. This is not a natural data. It's, it's, it's not found data. Data are always the product of choices and decisions. Now, these choices and decisions are ones that have both social and technological ramifications. So the metaphor, the common uh, repeated phrase in Silicon Valley that data is the new oil is simply not true. It's not out there waiting to be found or discovered. If anything, data are the new hydropower. The dams of our collective data need to be built, they need to be engineered, and that data need to be collected and harnessed. So this concept that there is an objective data reality out there that's somehow separate and natural and occurring is playing into a set of political and cultural decisions on who gets to have power over the choices that are being made. What are those choices? The second kind of key concept about the data that's driving our systems today is that seeing data as the product of human interactions and human communication lets us understand that the large language models that are posing such a threat in our newspapers emanate from the traces of these interactions. The data are us. But without the context, these interactions become meaningless. This is where we get into challenges of how this debate has been framed. Toby mentioned the Google engineer, Jeffrey Hinton, um, very publicly saying he wanted to now be able to criticize large language models and neural nets that he helped put into place. But two years ago this spring, two researchers at Google, along with others, authored a paper suggesting that the very pathway this development was occurring on was flawed. The idea that we can use massive amounts of data massive traces of our interactions and emerge with intelligence is on the face of it a little nonsensical to social scientists and humanists. They called their paper a metaphor of stochastic parrots or probabilistic parrots, that what large language models are able to do is pretty well parrot back what's likely to be the next word, the next phrase, the next framing. But language as we know, as linguists like Emily Bender, one of the authors of this paper, language is more than parroting back. It's about understanding context. It's about understanding conceptual models. It's about fundamentally understanding what my co-author Peter Noyge and I have called the imagined affordances of what technologies are. Another linguist, computational linguist, has put forward the idea that if we ask ChatGPT, which is better for a worker who has forgotten their hair covering in a restaurant, a hamburger bun or a sandwich wrapper? Which would better serve as a replacement for a hairnet? For a human, that's not a hard choice. I mean, imagine putting a brioche bun on your bun. Um, it doesn't work. Conceptually, I even heard a giggle in the auditorium. Um, conceptually, we have a mental picture that tells us, of course, that's not right. And yet, language models don't have those pictures. What they have is a map a map of conversations that have happened on the internet, a map of our interactions. 
but not a map of conceptual navigation. So without this context, the data are both human but completely dehumanized. That large language models driving this enthusiasm around artificial intelligence has a, not the ability to help us navigate these systems. I have a quote if I can get, if I can navigate, if speaking of navigation, if I can navigate toward the rest of the notes. No, I think I'm only going to be able to see my first, my first sentence. Oh well, we'll get there. Um, so in the Stochastic Parrots paper, two Google researchers faced retribution for calling for caution in developing large language models, caution in understanding that to develop these models, they would need to get ever more resources built, ever more finely grained into the system, that, that it would become um, not only stochastic but asymptotic, that the line to the marginal benefit of increasing these models will take more data, more resources, more time. What did they suggest? That the benefits of improving models should be weighed against financial and environmental costs. Just this week, just today, New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman said humanity is now opening two Pandora boxes simultaneously, that of AI and that of climate change. What if, he suggested, we use one to help the other? And yet, this denies the realities that we're facing increasing material, physical infrastructures that are being built to drive these models. Where are the guardrails? Where is the paint on the asphalt? Where are the highway signs? Where is the driving instruction? Where is the infrastructure that we all enjoy for safety in our social and cultural worlds? How is that infrastructure being developed? I would posit that we are faced with one of the world's largest ever social experiments. That this notion of power within data is being based on a flattened insight on social behavioral analysis. That the, the sense of humanness built into our AI models is a flattened one. And it is a powerful one because it is, as I have said, an enormous grab for political, economic, and social power. We have allowed this idea of data-driven efficiency to be the value by which we will be evaluating our choices. So this data that companies are using is an enormous financial investment. Make no mistake about it, the very large models that we're talking about are really at the purview of only a few companies in the world. Some of the largest financial concentrations of power humanity has ever seen. And so when we talk about data as power, we need to remember that we are thinking clearly and consciously about choices that are building into infrastructure, financial and economic concentrations of power that society will build upon. I mean power too as material and physical. The current operating costs for ChatGPT, not the training costs, the daily operating costs are estimated to be north of 600,000, 600,000 euros a day. That's simply to run the infrastructure of the model 
and the people excited to work on it. <clears throat> we get to ask ourselves, is this the kind of future that we want to power? And we must ask ourselves as a society, is this the kind of future we can afford to power with climate change and net zero goals as part of the other Pandora's box? So we've talked about infrastructure, and now I'd like to talk about work. So we've talked about the future of AI ethics as if the only thing that matters are the choices that technology designers make. In fact, I've been really amused by the, the bluster around AI in the last, I don't know, month, the kinds of questions I get. Um, just today, I was asked by a reporter, uh, I was asked, um, can you answer this in, in an email? Will AI take all of our jobs generally? Are there specific industries that AI will take jobs in? And, and how long will it take? Okay. Let, me, let me just bang that out in a three sentence email because I know, we all know, right? This is an enormous uh, social experiment that we've had. The, the, the state of the art in economic knowledge around productivity is kind of a collective shrug. We actually don't know what we're going to see um, in terms of the net impact of artificial intelligence on work. We, the ILO have estimated that 100 million jobs will be gained in the next 10 years, and 75 million jobs will be lost. Now, that's a net gain of 25 million jobs. That's great, except if you're one of 75 million people who will lose jobs over AI. We know that the composition of our jobs is going to change very quickly. That is the composition of individual tasks that make up our work. I was joking today that when AI replaces me as a, as a doctoral supervisor, some, there may be some PhD students in the, in the room. That's PhD student right there. Um, I didn't mean to embarrass you, sir. Um, but you should finish your dissertation. Um, uh, uh, when, when AI replaces a doctoral supervisor, it will say you know, three things. You need a stronger introduction. You need better transitions between your points. And you need a stronger conclusion, because that's what I always say. So, OK. We forget. Um, in the bluster of the last month of, of concern on AI, we have forgotten um, some of the most critical work that is done of making technologies function in use. This is a, a picture from um, my book manuscript that I'm finishing with Carrie Sturt Stosick, a civil engineer at the University of Washington. And this is a picture from the beginning of such an automated technology that was supposedly going to completely revolutionize work in large scale construction. When we started, oh, so many years ago, um, the image on the hard hats on the gentleman in this photograph, the protective head covering, um, says their safety check date is 2009. So it gives you a sense of when this photograph was taken. Um, when we started in this project, industry uh, enthusiasm was so high that this would completely change what companies would look like who would be working in construction, how construction would be done. It would eliminate jobs, it would create jobs, not unlike the rhetoric that we are hearing about AI. And yet, fast forward more than a decade, and those kind of highly anticipated changes haven't occurred 
even though the tool is widely used. And so part of the challenge of our book is to ask, well, why? What makes it so hard to completely wipe out industries? What makes it so hard to completely disrupt ways of working? What makes old patterns of work, cultures at work, laws, rules, regulations, what makes them so sticky? And yet, the answer is in my line of inquiry. We do. We talk about technology as if it's always the input to work, that somehow the tech does stuff to us, and not as if it's the output of an enormous and phenomenal amount of navigation and negotiation on behalf of us in everyday choices and decisions that we make. People will make these negotiations at work, much like these gentlemen did. How are we going to use this tool to benefit us? Will it become something useful for us? And what parts will we simply ignore, or resist, or fail to adopt? We're using the concept of negotiated innovation. And negotiating innovation, we argue, is a, is a four-step model of how new technologies come to make sense to us and how they come to change what we do. Now, the social scientists in the room will recognize in this model that it's an interplay between um, social structures and localized practices. In other words, you know, some of the building blocks that we have in social theory of this idea between individual agency and organizational and institutional constraint. And yet, try to find that balance between the individual and the institutional, organizational, social, cultural, in theories of technology disruption, much less try to find them in the newspaper headlines, and it's really hard to do. So our model starts with the process of sense-making, of people trying to figure out what a new technology is. And part of the sense-making is what we call futuring work, of understanding the future and, how, and making the future in how a new technology will come to matter. It's these conversations that we have, that we're having like the one tonight, that come to show us what might be possible and what we might want to try to change. This sense-making work that happens, and here I'm using sense-making in the, in the sense of Carl Weick, the organizational psychologist, this sense-making that we do leads to certain expectations that sets up how we interact with new technologies in our workplace. And these expectations shape and deliver how new technologies come to be. So in the case of the building information technology that we studied in construction, these ex expectations were very quickly shaped by the fact that getting engineers, architects, and constructors to share highly sensitive information simply wasn't going to happen easily. Too many laws, too many regulations, too much history, standard of practice in how those documents came to matter within that industry stood in the way of a technology that was literally designed to help them share. And so what happens when these expectations don't meet the affordances or the imagined affordances of certain tools? It becomes putting into practice negotiating those practices literally on the ground. The people making change are not the technology designers, they're not the CEOs, they're not the CTOs, they're not the CIOs. They're literally people deciding in their jobs what works, what works for them, 
and what will work for their team. And in the process, they come to understand which rules they break. Now, rules here I'm using um, as a stand-in. They're understanding which of the social, organizational, and institutional constraints that they can push back on. And as we know as social scientists, some changes take longer than others. That's where the model comes full circle. Understanding how to negotiate those changes takes time. And it is through a process of negotiating those changes that we become to see the technology designed in use, the, the socio-technical infrastructure that it can be. Thus, negotiated innovation is a better lens for thinking through how these changes are made in practice than simply one that short circuits that process. If we are to make AI work for us, it, we're literally making it work. We are literally, as societies, figuring out what we will change and what we will do. It is with this notion of social agency that these choices become apparent and so vital to our future. And so that brings me to our third section of tonight's talk, the future, that AI is what we make it. And I'd like to present a short overview of how I think work and infrastructure help us think through the future. So first, this notion of infrastructure. The choices about what kinds of technological paving are being made now. And by that I mean what kinds of standards, what kinds of data, what kinds of systems, what kinds of norms, what kinds of challenges are we going to allow and tolerate within our societies? Will these choices that are being made now be accountable to multiple publics? That's a choice we face at the moment. A second choice around infrastructure is that of lock-in. The idea that we are making choices that allow certain companies with enormous amounts of data power to preserve their power. And with every blustery fear and blustery rhetoric, we are only bolstering their case discursively by saying there is no alternative. There are alternatives, and there are alternatives to the lock-in and the choices that are being made now. The question that I would pose is how will openness in these systems be preserved? Will we continue to build a geopolitical reality where the material and infrastructural resources for building large-scale computing systems are so great that governments and democratic values are set aside? Will we continue making choices about infrastructure that prioritizes and privileges innovation over every other value? In terms of work, expectations now are shaping how people understand what AI will be able to do and how it will be able to function. My challenge to audiences like this one is will we rise to the challenge? Will we rise to the challenge of understanding what we can do creatively with these technologies and how we can make them work for the good of society. 
And finally, our lessons on work and looking at large-scale construction over a decade show us that the negotiations that people make in their jobs really matter for how technologies come to be adopted on large-scale industries and across sectors. Those negotiations are happening now. How will we ensure that the expertise of people on the ground counts? How will we ensure that people who can bring the context and oversight into models, who can understand the background, the foreground, the conceptual map, and the imagined affordance, how will we ensure that our human expertise comes to matter in building these systems? And so I promise to point us toward a future of what can be done. I am running a center called the Mindaroo Center for Technology and Democracy. And we have a mission to do values-driven research. Now, these two concepts sometimes come into um, an uneasy alliance within the objective scientific approach to social science. And yet, we're fighting to make digital technologies that work for people, societies, and the planet. And we do this by trying to reimagine our relationship with digital technologies through evidence-based change. So how can we bring evidence to the kinds of debates that help us reimagine what we want, what society wants out of their relationship to digital technologies? We have four key initiatives that we're working on. And the first is the public impact, the public understanding of digital technologies and their impact, trying to shift the narrative away from thinking that technological change is inevitable or always in the good, and trying to shift the, 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 the discourse away from let others decide. The second is to bring a lens that helps us under stand the enormous environmental costs of our digital information infrastructure. These are not costs we should be taking on lightly, N nor should we, let me be clear, N nor should we simply reject them, but we should be making choices on the kinds of, ch on the kinds of impact that we want to have on the world. And perhaps if we go back two years and we only listened to Team Nick Gabriel and Margaret Mitchell at Google saying, please, large language models won't be improved without vast resources of energy, financial cost, and environmental costs for marginal benefits in their quality. We might have had different kinds of conversations if the critical voices in this debate were not silenced. The third initiative we work on is making the future of work work for all. And by this, we take an access and ability lens. Too many of our digital techno technological infrastructures are quickly becoming new kinds of urban infrastructures. Consider every app that doesn't take into account the enormous amount of work that people with different abilities need in order to navigate their daily lives. By taking an access and ability lens to the future of work, we start to ask questions about where is work and who's doing that labor. And finally, we have an initiative on building informed trust in digital societies. And this is one of the hardest of our initiatives for me to explain because I want to be really careful here. Trust is declining in Western societies. People's trust in one another has declined and yet 
it's, we know it's not because of digital technologies. There's a complicated relationship to be unpacked and discovered between how we can have technologies that help reinforce trust and help rebuild social capacity. So it's not as easy, to, sim simple to say, let's get rid of technology, we'll have more trust. But rebuilding trust in society is vital if we're going to have fair, just, and equitable societies that are resilient and sustainable in digital futures. So what are we doing about it? Well, last month we announced a new consortium um, funded through the European Union AI for Trust. This is a consortium of 17 partners in 11 different countries, including some of us who are no longer in the EU. The idea is to, the idea is to use, um, to build an early detection system for mis- and disinformation and use the best of our AI tools to propose counter narratives. So think of an early warning system that allows for human in the loop fact checkers and journalists to be ready with counter stories. It's a great project working with fact checking organizations across the EU. And the challenge is that many of these tools that we have for fighting mis- and disinformation sit in the hands of large platform companies. And they're not multilingual, as the challenges are in the EU. They haven't been forethought in terms of being multi-channel, being able to jump across multiple platforms. And they don't work well with generated text, video, audio, yet. And so that's the challenge that we've taken on in that project. The next project is one to help bring more researchers, more social science researchers into these questions of technology design for too long I would argue that social scientists and humanists have been sprinkled on top of technological projects. We've sat in the corner and critiqued after the fact, rather than get involved in the hard choices and decisions of building technologies that work for people. So with funding from the UK's Economic and Social Research Council, we're building a network in the UK and beyond to focus on the digital good. Well, this is another one of those social science projects that skirts that line around values. What is good? Good for whom? Good when and why? If we want to have good digital societies, we need to be able to understand what good looks like. We need to be able to define it and measure it. And yes, we need to be able to hand a page of tech specs over to engineers. The challenge for the Digital Good Network is to think about these ideas of good and how we might do something about it from a social science perspective. And that's a kind of challenge that many of us, myself included, have been, we've shied away from. My call to action for the researchers in the room is that we must absolutely begin to be invested and involved in making sure that our digital technological infrastructure works for us. And with that, I'm going to issue a call to everyone in the room and listening online that the choices that we will be making with artificial intelligence technologies are not set in stone yet. They're not paved. We have options ahead of us, but it will take concerted work, negotiations, and yes, difficult work of challenging 
dominant narratives and resisting change in order to make the kinds of digital societies that work. My fear is that we won't rise to the challenge, but my hope is that we, particularly looking at this audience tonight, will be able to. And with that, I hope you'll join us in discussion. Thank you so much, Gina, for uh, the many insights in your topics. Of course, the first question has to be, so how many jobs are going to go and how long will it take exactly? But uh, maybe we'll put this at the 57 end. 57 years. 57 years, thank you. So please note that down. This is the first. Um, I kept thinking about the example you um, gave about the two social researchers at Google that were fired after they warned about, you know, the lack of context uh, on the road to, uh, to AI at Google. So this was two years ago, and as we know, things changed incredibly fast in the field, in the technological field, in the discourse about AI also. Do you see a certain change in that, that the standing of the social sciences and the development of uh, generative AI or other types of AI has actually gotten better in the last two years, or has it gotten worse even? What's your take on that? Uh, so, uh, we are now seeing, we're, when, when we look at these um, models online, we are looking back in time. Right, so we understand this about ChatGPT, right? It's not the latest model that OpenAI has uh, done, and its, its view of the world stopped on the internet, right? It's built, and then it's put into place. Um, one of the things I find audiences have the hardest time decoupling is a notion of learning away from what we say when we say these systems learn. So the, the learning in terms of the knowledge on the internet that's being used to generate these systems, um, that learning's over, right, for ChatGPT, right? That's, that's a static model. And what we can see and build on top of that is the interactions that people have with it. And so, in many ways, there's a, there's a brittleness there. There's an assumption, because we're calling it intelligence, because we, because we as humans learn, because we learn from mistakes and experience, that, that these models will adapt, they'll evolve. All the, all the rhetoric that we see in the, in the, in the news around uh, you know, AI growing too smart and becoming sentient, that's based on a model of intelligence that simply isn't the model of intelligence that these models are working on, right? It's not how they work. And so the idea that they've somehow evolved over time um, is not true. Now, what is happening is they're out of data. Like, we're literally at the risk of having exhausted the corpus of the internet that can train large language models. When you're talking about the numbers of parameters that are in these models, the sheer size of the data, the, the, the ability for these, um, these systems to be able to be improved, we're, we're, we're running out of things to feed it. We're running out of energy, we're running out of uh, computing capacity, and we're running out of data. Wells are dry. The wells dry. Mm -hmm. well. Now, would it helped, or had it helped, um, in the past, if we 
called it differently, if he hadn't called it intelligence or if he had like more different types of terms to describe it, because uh, as you, you know, say pattern matching, predictions, probability and so forth is not what we usually uh, associate with uh, human intelligence. Um, because of the lack of conceptual thinking that you talked about uh, in your talk, do you think we'd have to find new terms? The terms that we're using to talk about artificial intelligence come with political choices um, that put us on particular paths. And those choices should be, should be made consciously. So the idea that a group of engineers obsessed with science fiction uh, that's not a joke. <laughs> Obsessed with science fiction, build out visions of the world where technocratic expertise is prioritized above all and computing power is the dominant power in society where everyone else can literally be enslaved and subservient to it. Um, wow, that is not my vision of how I want a digital future to look like. And yet, these concepts have deep-seated roots in these 1950s, 60s, 70s visions that are overwhelmingly male, overwhelmingly Western, overwhelmingly white. And these, these conceptual notions of what intelligence is what knowledge is, what values are, and what society is, have driven a flattened model of the socio-technical that leaves us with less room to draw on for our cultural imaginaries where we go forward. So one of the, I always do a shout out to this book if I can, for those of you who haven't seen Meredith Broussard's um, wonderful book, Artificial Unintelligence. She traces this history in a critical way. And then her new uh, book, Glitch, more than a glitch, looks at how these concepts of, of bias aren't simply byproducts of this vision. They are literally baked into the very engineering and the choices that have been made. There's always the question about the... Um about agency, of course, you know, how to change these processes, and you have hinted at them in, in your talk too, putting into practice, negotiating change, negotiating innovation, so to speak, with a different set of stakeholders, taking account of everyday lives of workers at the workplace and so forth. Could you give us a couple of examples how, how uh, this actually works very concretely? What does this mean, negotiating innovation at the workplace? What would have to be done differently uh, in order for those models to work uh, more justly. Let's start with a simple fact that in countries where workers have greater representation in manufacturing decisions, so in countries like Germany where workers are part of management councils um, to understand how to implement new technologies, we actually see higher productivity gains from the introduction of automated technologies. So lo and behold, having people who understand the frontline choices and challenges that are happening in the workplace when automating technologies come in, into line, um, that kind of sweet magic of having human and automated, human and AI um, interaction becomes a pathway for productivity. In countries where we don't see that close coupling around that decision making, um, we see lower productivity gains. Okay, so there's one pretty concrete example. In the work that we did on automated visualization techno techniques in, in, in construction, this wasn't a um, kind of a call to arms. In fact, we didn't, we didn't even start out trying to see um, this negotiation 
happen, right? We thought, okay, great, you know, there's this new technology and it's gonna cause job loss and we're gonna be there to study it at the ground and kind of understand what people are doing about it and with it and how they're resisting it and challenging it. And what we saw instead was a whole lot of work that went into simply making the thing work. And that's what I think gets missed in these concrete examples about how AI will replace jobs. It's like, okay, well, tell me what, what part of the job and how will you make it so that um, you can trust it? How do you make it so that you can understand it? How will you make it so that it works with the other parts of the system? And how will you bring that ever important context to the decisions? That ever important conceptual map that humans carry with us that understands the difference between a hamburger bun and a sandwich wrapper and what they might look like, feel like, how they might be embodied. This idea that we have these certain capacities for being able to imagine the affordances of the life world, of the technological life world around us, and bring it into how we interact is part of what makes that so powerful. And so seeing construction workers basically do this, right, spend hours and hours and weeks and days to build these complex models of the construction projects they were working on simply to have m millimeters of tolerance, uh, millimeters of difference throw the models off, or simply to have some of the organizational challenges of not be being able to get the right information from the right company at the right time. When we look at these banalities, we start to understand that those kind of complexities are really what we do in our work. We navigate these challenges. It's what humans are really good at. And so when we have these conversations about AI eliminating those kinds of jobs, it's like, okay, maybe there's a lot of really onerous, repetitive tasks that will be eliminated, but in terms of making things that delight, excite, engage, and yes, fit in a particular context, we're still gonna be very good at that. Interesting what you say about the coupling of um, artificial intelligence and the human workforce. I think this is something similar I was referencing in my introduction with Joanna Bryson told us uh, two years ago about the Swedish uh, uh, radiologist, like where, where Hinton was wrong actually when he predicted that AI is going to take over their work and uh, Joanna told us no, uh, the opposite happened. There was a gain in productivity, uh, what you just described. But this leads us to another, I'm not sure of a problem, but to another topic topic uh, of what you talked about, and this is something like, um, you know, masked AI or opaque AI that sometimes consumers or users, however you want to call them, do not know, is it actually a real AI I'm interacting with or with the human factor built into there that some AI companies sort of mask uh, or veil um, the human aspect or even part uh, of the product they're selling be it because they want to attract um, capital <laughs> that is, you know, interested in artificial intelligence and not in the human workforce, so to speak. Uh, be it because it's just not very cool. Be it because they can outsource cheap labor uh, to other uh, regions of the world, which they probably couldn't do in other countries. Um, so how to fix that? Or in other words, how do you make transparent the human factor um, in an artificial intelligence model? I think the first thing is to remember that these systems are enormous accomplishments of, of work mm. and the, they're very good at masking that. So um, take chat GPT, right? Open AI has this wonderful little simple box and it looks so simple and easy you don't see the literal millions that have been spent on the engineering. You don't see the, 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 the hundreds of thousands being spent every day 
on the energy and compute time to run the simple little box. But you also, you also don't see the sheer human labor that it takes to clean these systems up. The amount of work it takes to translate the internet into something that is safe and seemingly safe is enormous amounts of work. And so just today, um, it was announced that several of the um, employees who worked with one of the companies that outsourced some of the work on OpenAI's model, that they are union, they have voted to unionize. Oh. The amount of work that it takes someone somewhere around the world to do to make these systems work is phenomenal. So they look like they're automated but in the words of um, uh, anthropologist Mary Gray and Siddharth Suri, it's ghost work that's making them run. It's work that's hidden, it's global, it follows old colonial patterns of, of labor exploitation. It's this kind of unseen work from labeling, from content moderation, that is is making the thing run in addition to the designers and things. So there's that kind of work. There's also the work that we will be doing, that we're doing in order to make them sensible and integrated into what we mean. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, um, the, the principal of my, of my kid's school recently kind of called me and said, I'm really worried about chat GPT. And I was like, okay, really? Like, let, I don't know. Like, tell me, what are you worried about? And there is... Um, suddenly a sensible educator's white paper. How are we going to use, react, respond, teach about, um, guide, do? Suddenly there's an enormous amount of work that we're doing to think, okay, how are we going to make this thing fit with our social values, with our social systems, with our social and institutional rules. And, and that's the work that I think gets missed in, in how we think about these. So if we're just listening to, to the narratives, if we're just listening to the discourse that's coming out from an, an engineering perspective of the world, we are missing the work that it takes to build capacity in society, to ready digital society for building good societies, and the work of social science and, and everyday interactions to make sense of what we're seeing and to try to make it better. Yeah, the engineering perspective, if you allow that last question before we open up here um, to the floor, the engineering perspective is most of the times, if I may say so, a perspective about growth, right? Uh, it's a perspective that uh, is designing growth uh, for those uh, large language models and other um, artificial intelligence. Now, when I think of a couple of your key terms um, of your talk or of our conversation, the well is dry. You know, massive resources would be needed for marginal benefits uh, to make those models better uh, and so forth, and the carbon footprint of this all. So we might make those models a lot better, but uh, our butts are going to be burning uh, at the same time, and those models are ready uh, to do so. Um, I come to think of your initial metaphor um, of infrastructure and pavement, paving, right? I mean, it seems like most of the beaches are paved already uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence. And uh, it's even the same word in the internet and, and in infrastructure, it's traffic, right? Uh, traffic is going to, I mean, if we continue like this uh, and with all the even just vague projections of what artificial intelligence is going to burn up uh, in the, let's say, next 10 years, um, this will not work. I mean, it, the perspective of growing exponentially due to artificial intelligence is really explicitly dangerous when it comes to the carbon footprint. So traffic will have to decrease somehow. It cannot grow exponentially. Is this something that you think tech companies are actually aware of and do tackle? Uh, or is it something that is just plain wrong? 
there's, there's a push within tech companies that if we only um, buy enough green energy, so energy from around the globe for, from green sources, to power our ever-growing arsenal of data centers. And if we, if we only buy enough carbon offsets that we will solve the problem. And yet, we have an industry that is, represents an enormous electricity footprint with growing capacity needs, demanding more resources more data centers, more energy. My colleague Yuli Rone's new paper on the data negotiations, that the negotiations, the political negotiations that happen around citing data centers, um, shows that large platform companies are ruthless in presenting to local and national governments this supposedly sweet deal that they will take increasingly large amounts of the green grid capacity so that they can report that they are green. They can report greenness. Um, we also know that within companies, compute time has become a, a, a difficult resource so that when, we're, that when these very large models are being trained, and operated, that they are literally working at global scale to understand where compute resources are and how to manage and shift them around the globe. I'm not saying it's a future we want to unplug, quite the opposite. I think we want to be thoughtful about whether or not serving up marginally better advertising is worth that cost um, versus models and modeling that may be um, giving us more social benefit. So the idea that we're simply allowing Google, for example, or Facebook or Amazon, um, to make the choices about how they will develop large models. Because trust us, you know, this is this is really good. Like we know where we know where to put this paving down, and we're putting our bet over here. The idea that that is how we are allocating these resources in a time of climate crisis to me gives me pause. Like, okay, is that the choice we are going to be faced with? Is that the choice that we want to sit with? That this is the best investment of our resources at a time when we need to be asking, is this enough? And then finally, I'll, I'll, and I know we've got questions coming from the audience. Um, my colleague at the center, Hunter Vaughn, is um, with Nicole Starskaleski looking at the undersea cable network. This metaphor of the cloud feels very appealing until you understand that most of the cloud is literally under the sea. That old colonial pathways of telecommunications mapping telegraphs around the world still trace the global sea cables that power the internet. And when you look at what is happening in the development of companies building their own infrastructure, when large platform companies are literally laying their own sea cable to build their own own internet infrastructure, their own data infrastructure, we have to ask, is the impact on our oceans worth it? I don't know. I don't know how we go about answering that question, but they're questions that should be asked, and they're not being asked in ways that allows for people to participate in the transparency and accountability that will lead to fair, just, and equitable digital futures. 
Thank you so much for this uh, wrap up for now and of your talk and our conversations. Gina, I think it's time to open up. I think we have one or two microphones. We have two microphones uh, on the floor. We start with questions here in the theater itself and then we'll go on and see what happened in the digital realm at Slido. I can't see that well. I can see a little bit, but uh, yeah, let's take a question from the gentleman, gentleman in the second row, please. And then. Hi, thank we'll you. See. <clears throat> thank you for. Your, your presentation. My name is Mathana. I'm a tech ethicist, um, gender non-binary. I think it's one of the things we can all do to make sure that we don't pre-assume any sort of categorization or codifying in our social context. So I use they, them, not a gentleman. And I think this goes to the, one of the issues around AI, is even when our existing social constructs presuppose things about the other, that is very hard to have these systems not trickle into our large language models, our, our machine learning. Um, Dr. Neff, I, my, my question for you is, one of the things that I kind of saw was missing from this discussion was any talk of China or the global south. Uh, we're seeing Baidu and other companies roll out also large language models as well. And when you talk about the well is dry, I was curious on one hand if that is only from kind of the corpus of English language text, because we're as global infrastructure projects are competing, if China, China's going into Africa, technology is also following that way as well. So there's this kind of global geopolitical struggle, right, between Western, tele, uh, the big five companies and, and Chinese companies. And there's this struggle kind of for the next generation of digital societies. And so I'm just wondering when we're talking about making AI work for quote unquote us, who is the us here? And does this take into part the, the, the narrative for people in the global south? When you talk about multiple publics and good of societies, when you talk about um, the you know, alternatives to lock-ins. Is the alternative for lock-ins actually, does it exist only outside of a Silicon Valley model or outside of also a, a global technological landscape? And I guess finally, how do we bring in more voices, voices of color, people of, of, who are non-gender binary into the institutions like yours? Um, I think we've actually had some discussion on, on Twitter in the past, you and I, and, and this is one of the things I've been saying for, for a while. How do we make sure that the organizations that are leading the charge in this are also representation of not just, indiv not just academia, but society, global society at large? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, a, a few things that resonate, yes. Um, the uh, um, Dame Wendy Hall, computer scientist in the UK, has talked about the four internets, right? That we can't think of a single global internet, that we have um, multiple uh, assemblages of rules and norms and apps and interoperability and, and um, uh, systems that are shaping how we think about this. Um, yes, it's no surprise that it's being seen and painted as a geopolitical struggle of who will win in some of the national security conversations that I've been a part of. It will not be surprising that um, there is an American rhetoric that says, you know, America must win or the world will be over. Um, not that that's a rhetoric that I would sign up to or agree to, but that is, that is a, a language that is being used. So what does this mean outside of a US, China, Russia struggle? And is the world being carved in such a way that repeats a kind of uh, new technological colonialism? I, I look to activists who are um, actively engaging in the kinds of tech ethic conversations that happen around the world the organization whose knowledge has been incredibly active in bringing, um, highlighting 
the challenges of having the internet in local languages. For many people in lo local language, Facebook is the internet, that in something like a majority of the world's language, the, the majority of the pages they can access are now um, uh, through pl private providers. And so there is um, increasingly, I think, this call for doing the kind of on the ground work that you're leading and I applaud you for it. So keep up the great work. Thank you. Ah, oh, you already picked one. Hello, good evening. Thank you very much. Um, actually, my, my question is a little bit, can be seen a little bit as a follow-up on that. Um, I was wondering, we were talking a lot about like how this ghost work happens, how populations in the global south especially suffer more with these um, badly paid works to train AI systems which will be mostly benefited by the global south in many aspects and also the mineral aspects that come forth on that uh, expenditure of water which is this, the case that we saw recently in Uruguay when they disclosed how, how the, the amount of water that will be um, consumed by a data center of, of Google. So my question is, um, and like just one brief comment before that. In Brazil, for instance, we are discussing a, a bill proposal which has, has some similarities, which aims to bring uh, platforms toward accountability. And we have been seeing a campaign by social platforms to influence population, how they have been driving their uh, advertisement and their recommendations against this bill in a way that is much more violent, I guess, than what happened, for instance, here with the Digital Services Act. So I wonder, due to the um, who biggest to the bigger power, so, uh, economic, political, that countries um, have to large degrees in the global south, in the global north, sorry. I would like to hear from you if, uh, if you think that regulators here, legislators as well, uh, shouldn't be doing maybe more to tackle these issues. Uh, considering that, as I mentioned first, uh, although we are using the work of these people, the minerals of other populations isn't the main, aren't the main benefits coming towards this region of the world where we are. Uh, so thank you very much. That's, that's a great question. Um, yes, should we be doing more? Uh, yes, we should. Um, I think the, the pathway you point to regulation, absolutely. Um, regulation is uh, regulation and organizing, two of the strong tools in our toolkit. I want to also say that there's a kind of accountability that we can hold companies to. Um, it's difficult work. It's not a re replacement for the other two, but um, encouraging, uh, demanding that better of the companies that we have products and service with, that they do full environmental accounting, that they understand and report the costs of their AI systems, that they are clear on what they are doing in terms of mitigating these um, infrastructures, and that we are not simply taking for an answer that because something is digital, it therefore must be green. This, this kind of um, false uh, green narrative of the digital economy has, has gotten us into a whole lot of trouble. We're forgetting about the resources it takes for data centers. We're forgetting about the resources that it takes for the hardware, the minerals, the extractive technologies that are that are that are fueling this infrastructure. So that so that um, you know we need we need to be we need to be working. We need to be working as citizens, as civil society. And I think as because there are researchers in the room, I think there is a role for research to play. I think we can bring our voices together. We can bring the best expertise that we have together. We can start to have clearer 
um, calls for the kinds of things that are good um, and the kinds of good that we want to see for good digital society, I think there is a role for that to play too. Okay, let's take uh, one more uh, from Jeanette, and I'll come back to you before uh, we look to slide over. Jeanette, please. You don't have a microphone, so please the microphone to the third row up here. Anybody? Then we'll switch to the digital sphere for a minute and come back to the gentleman in the first row afterwards, okay? Thank you uh, for this interesting talk. Um, as far as I understood you, you make a very strong procedural point, sort of opening up the discourse, questioning narratives, getting more voices heard. But what follows from that? Because power, of course, doesn't go away from opening the discourse and listening to more voices. And also, it's not clear to me how we do make substantial choices. Toby, for example, asked, do we need to downscale? Um, do we need to use less uh, energy? Do we need to sort of reduce traffic? And then you say, I don't know. I guess nobody here knows, but how do we come to these decisions? How do we define what is good when we know that good as such is a very contested issue? And it can't be sort of, it would be naive to think there is consensus somewhere in the future. There never will be. As always, um, provocative question from Jeanette, thank you. Um, and I will take you at your word. Um, because the good is contested and difficult does not mean we should shy away from it. And that's what social science has done for too long. We have simply said, oh, we don't have a clear answer, therefore we don't have an answer. Um, and I don't think, no pun intended, that's good enough for now. We have um, excused ourselves from debates over what is good for society and ceded that to, if I may, engineers who have happily stepped into the void. That is the socio-technical choice and challenge I think we face in social science because we have found that Engineers will happily engineer the world for us if we don't get involved. Do I think there's clear choice and consensus? No. Do we have democratic modes of accountability, transparency, um, and decision-making that help us model what some of these complex choices can be? Yes. Do we have models of technologies in the past that have not been clear-cut in terms of their benefit, but we have come with nice choices? We have come with understanding the risks and the balances? Absolutely. We have never gotten to a place where we want a good fair, just, and equitable future. We have never gotten to that point by simply relying on the private companies to tell us what's good for us. And that's the fear that I have now. So do I have the answer? Should, which, which large language models should we tamp down on? I cannot answer that question alone, nor would I pres presume to try. But should we be allowing for-profit companies to dominate the infrastructure that we will have for communication and interaction in our daily and everyday life? Should they be the only ones making the choice? I can answer that question, and that's a definitive no. Thank you. Okay, let's look at Slido. Sarah, uh, please, for a minute. She needs a microphone here with the computer in the fourth row to tell us about Slido, and then I'll get back to you, right? Um, a question on a more concrete level. In what areas of work and societal uh, area do you think it is promising to extend employing AI systems and to make them work for us? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the second half of your question. In what areas of work do I think are promising? Yeah, um, in what areas of work do I think are promising? Listen, I um, 
have been I have been so impressed in watching a radically automating technology at work over a decade. I do not recommend this for any dissertation PhD students. Do not spend a decade in the field. I have been so honored to be able to witness the creativity of people in their jobs trying to make sense of how a new technology will change their work, trying to make sense of how to um, do their jobs while being told they must integrate these new ways of working and figuring out those pathways. I think a lot of jobs have that capacity. So concretely, I don't want to say, well, you know, professional workers are going to have more power because they, you know, they do things in this particular way. The, the place I worry about, where I have less optimism, um, um, is, is in how people are trained at work. So in, in many early studies that we have about um, robotic surgery, for example, we see new surgeons struggle to get the experience they need when robotic surgery is introduced. So it's not the experienced surgeons that have a challenge. It's people new to the space that are fighting for the more routine kinds of um, uh, everyday ordinary kinds of situations that are the first ones that are automated. Um, tax audit, for example, many of us do not think about tax consulting work, but it is, um, I, most of us don't think about tax consulting work, Some, unless you're a, a sociologist of work who is sitting in the audience. Everybody does in Germany. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> But in large consulting firms, the tax business is the business that young consultants got their start in. So it's become, it's become an entry pathway into professional work. What happens when much of that work can be automated? I don't think we're going to eliminate consultants. Consultants will be incredibly creative and they'll find new kinds of work to do productivity will continue and will increase. But this pathway of work will be a pathway that may be eliminated. We've seen that happen in legal discovery. Um, in law firms, legal discovery was a pathway where young attorneys learned how to read files, read documents, parse information. We know that can be done very quickly through large, large systems. And yet, um, we're not going to get rid of the legal profession anytime soon. However, that pathway is going to have to be recreated. How do we get new people into and skilled in the profession and work? And so that's the, that's the place where it's, it's less of an optimistic point, but it is a point that I think we have to be, as societies, we have to be incredibly mindful to how young people entering workforces will get those kinds of experiences when, when several of the rungs of the ladder, of the, of the occupational job ladder, have been automated. Yeah, I do have a follow-up uh, on the future of uh, work, risking journalistic bluster, I know, but maybe we can close with that. I don't want to let that gentleman in the first uh, row wait any longer. Please get the microphone to the first row, please. And we'll have another question from the floor. I think we're done by Slido, as I gather, from the audience. Thank you, Sarah. Please. Um, my question was about the uh, filtering of the language-based AI and how that relates to making AI work for us. For example, when um, ChatGPT first came out and was put to public use, people were very fast to see the sometimes very um, dangerous uh, suggestions or answers that ChatGPT could give. And um, OpenAI was quick to put some filtering and this filtering got stronger and stronger where some users were now complaining that ChatGPT was unable to provide the same help it did 
when first came out. So um, how do we manage the balance between having um, AI give us safe answers and having it just completely uh, useless because it tries to so strictly um, keep these filters? That's a, that's a great question. How, how do we balance um, safety and efficiency? It, n notice that's the kind of question that is a set of values. Um, where, where do we put that balance? My choices of safety over efficiency might be very different from yours, and it would certainly be very different from what I would wish for my child. Understanding these balances between the different competing values of what we want out of our technology is part of the choices that are being made and that are not explicitly addressed in, in, in how people understand what they're looking at and what they're doing. So, um, you know, I'm not going to defend or attack OpenAI for how they make those choices on, on, on um, safety and efficiency, except to say that um, we, we, we know we want to be able to use systems in ways that allow us to interact um, with information that we understand is um, uh, accurate, that we understand um, is useful and helpful, that we understand is not harmful to us. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, we've had to push for legislation that ensures that people are not harmed from interaction on the internet, that, that harms, that companies do what they can to assess and prevent the harms that are happening on their platforms. So one of the things that I have worked with, with Ruman Chowdhury, who um, was head of an ethics team at Twitter, is understanding the difference of harms that happen as uh, one-off kinds of harms, occasional harms, versus people who are subject to chronic abuse online or chronic harms. The idea that we can have a one-size-fits-all safety strategy is not a safety strategy that will work. And so we need better understanding of the differences of how people navigate spaces in order to ensure that everybody can benefit from these tools. Toby. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> I'm thinking how to put this um, as a wrap up because we're running a little bit out of time here. Oh, there's one more question. Okay, let's take one more and then we'll wrap it up. Um, yeah, my question is, would you say we, ha we as a society have to challenge those big tech companies and open AI and everything more in providing an actual use for the tools and technology they provide us with, they put into the world? Because um, we saw that open AI published ChatGPT but didn't really provide an actual use case. So would you say we would benefit from um, also regulation? That's <laughs> To totally different topic, but um, making companies more aware that they have to provide an actual benefit for us when they put us out these tools? Right, so where's, where's the benefit of generative AI? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great question. I mean, we, we, society, those of us in the room, we are all figuring out what we will use these tools for. Right now I can tell you many ways they will be used to amplify mis- and disinformation, to destabilize trust in trusted media, 
to become political weapons of understanding how to spread abuse and harm. Um, work that we have done in both the EU and the UK on, on generative AI um, image abuse, so um, AI-enabled image abuse, sometimes shortened or, or nicknamed deep fakes, suggest that we, we know that um, without company guardrails in place, certain kinds of users will be subject to more and different kinds of use. So we can think about a lot of different harms from generative AI. On the flip side, there's wonderful creative projects and artistic projects that are looking at what might be possible and what those boundaries might be. I'm not saying that any one of us have the answers to the kinds of choices of the, of the, of the good digital society, but I'm saying it's a conversation that collectively we need to be having, and we need to be asking and pushing for what kinds of tools and technologies will benefit people, societies, and the planet. And if we can't use that as a measure of the kinds of futures we want, then I'm not sure we, we, we want to be um, risking the kinds of challenges that we're gonna face in light of that. Now, Gina, the initial idea of this whole series, when it started in uh, uh, late 2017, was sort of to find out at the end of uh, each session or to each ask the question, is there mm, a European take or is there even room for a European take in this geopolitical tech race? We've been uh, uh, talking about a little bit, thanks to a question uh, from the audience. Is there such a thing uh, and what can we do? Um, so... Thinking about the future of work, I'm trying to tie this in with the um, with the future of work. One of the biggest, as you certainly know, as we all know, of the biggest challenges we're facing, not only in the West, but pretty much all over, is uh, economic equality. Uh, that is, in certain areas, as big as it was 100 years ago, um, talking about the US, uh, but it's getting there, so to speak, in Europe. It's mostly the uh, inequality of wealth, not so much the salaries, but wealth, um, capital. So... I get the feeling, and this might be just a very normal sort of anxiety, but I get the feeling that the jobs that artificial intelligence is going to wipe out sooner or later are going to be what I would call, or other people call, mid-cult jobs, right? It's not the unskilled labor, it's not the cheap labor, and it's not the work at the, at the, at the level of excellence, right? This is something that is probably not going to be affected on either end of the scale so much by AI, model, by AI models, but it's the mid-call. So this is something that I think points towards a future where we will see an increase of the already monstrous inequality of wealth that we're facing and that some social scientists think is going to be one of the biggest you know, routes for crisis in the future. Thomas Piketty is one of them, but he's not alone uh, in, in, in saying this. Uh, so I'm asking, you know, long story short, is there a European way of regulating these things? Are there uh, European initiatives that sort of try to regulate uh, those things from, you know, refraining from, from happening, actually? Because they are. I mean, this is imminent danger to not just social inequality, but uh, turmoil. Suggesting that we're going to um, get to social turmoil f um, on, 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 the, on, the, on the backs of AI working so well in so many different contexts, in so many different kinds of settings, um, to me suggests a kind of technological determinism that says this thing is coming, there's nothing we can do about it, we should just stop, we should just give up. The question is, just... what can we do about it? How can we regulate it? Is it, it the, the question of inequality, economic inequality, is always a political question to solve. 
And that question of economic inequality is not something that I think we need to um, couple to the choices and challenges of AI. We need absolutely to address economic inequality. We need absolutely to address failing schools. We need to absolutely address skills inequality. We need to absolutely address gender gaps in involvement in the greatest technological expansion that has happened. Mm -hmm. We need to absolutely address the questions of who's getting left behind from the creation of jobs. We need to absolutely address the question of why such concentration of financial wealth has been handled in companies that have such a small number, globally speaking, such a small number of employees. We need to ask very different kinds of questions about the distribution of the benefits of, of, of productivity than simply say, how are we going to regulate the AI systems to make those things happen? So, so, um, so we have our work cut out for us. We have work to cut out to understand how these tools will be used in the workplace, the creative and interesting um, and sometimes challenging ways that we'll be able to push back and negotiate that innovation and make it work in practice for us, for our coworkers, in our teams and in our companies, and ways we can resist it. But we also need to be having those kinds of questions about economic inequality and the kinds of fair and just society on a different level, and they may not be in the same realms of political contestation. Thank you. Thank you for turning up uh, on this day again. See you in September in this series. Thank you so much, Chinaneff. Nice talking to you. Have a good evening.